So a very, very warm welcome to you all this evening for this very exciting event as we are joined by the one and only Karen Arthur, who you can see on screen. We're also joined by our, by our Pro, Pro VC for Education, uh, Professor Deborah Johnson. So welcome to you both this evening. Um, this is a fantastic event um, to celebrate World Menopause Day and Black History Month. Um, we are halfway through our Black History Month programme and it's been a fantastic um, event series so far. And it's really embodied the theme of proud to be and tonight is no exception um, to that. Uh, my name is Neil hudson Basing. I'm the Corporate Events Manager for LSBU. I'm just going to take you through some virtual housekeeping before I hand over to Deborah for introduction and scene setting. And I'd like to start with a short statement on respect and dignity. Everyone attending or speaking at an LSBU event, whether in person or virtually, should be treated with respect, dignity and courtesy. LSBU operates an environment built on equality, inclusion and acceptance. We value contributions, feedback and comments and wish to create a space for sharing, learning, celebrating and bringing communities together. LSBU does not tolerate any form of bullying, abuse, harassment or discrimination. Inappropriate behaviour, including that that potentially impacts or contradicts LSBU's reputation and values, will be treated seriously and acted upon. Anyone exhibiting any example of this behaviour will also be removed from the webinar. We want our events to be an enjoyable, safe and warm experience for all. Thank you for adhering to these guidelines. So just to take you through the Zoom functionality, we are using Zoom Pro today, uh, which means you can turn your cameras and microphones on. Um, we ask you to keep them off until it's time for Q&A and uh, wear your happy moments later. Um, but if you could keep them on mute for the meantime. Um, if you have questions, um, you can use the chat box and we encourage you to check, use the chat box to share your introductions, tell us who you are, what you do and where you're joining us from. Um, but we'd like to keep our Q&A interactive later. So um, this, the event is recorded. So if you don't wish to feature in the recording, please, please pop your questions in the chat box. But if you're happy to ask a live question, simply pop your camera on, just signal to me that you'd like to ask a question and we'll come over to you during the Q&A. We have enables closed captioning, which are the subtitles that you can see appearing on your screen right now. If you don't wish to see them, you can click on the little up arrow next to CC live transcript and select hide subtitles and that will hide those for you. Finally, we'd love to see your thoughts in the chat box and on Twitter as well. Um, it, it makes sure that we have this event has impact beyond just the event itself. And I'll put our Twitter handle um, in the in the chat box just now. That's all from me. I'll be in the background if you have any questions at all. And without further ado, I'll hand over to my colleague Deborah. Thank you, Neil. Thank you very much, everyone, for being here. And it's my pleasure to welcome you, to welcome you to this virtual LSBU. Um, as Neil said, I'm Deborah Johnston. I'm the Pro Vice Chancellor Education here at LSBU. And I'm delighted that this evening we have a key, we have a keynote speech celebrating life after 50, an evening with Karen Arthur. I'd like to set the scene and talk about why this is such a brilliant event at the right time and the right place. Before I do that, I'm going to say what I always say when I um, uh, when I have the pleasure of hosting an event like this. I have got a stammer. I will get stuck on words this evening. And you know what? It'll all be fine. It will all be fine. Um, so I said this is timely. This is the right time and the right place because, of course, this is Black History Month. As Neil has said, um, this event is one of a series of events that um, that LSBU holds to commemorate the contribution of African and Caribbean communities to the UK, to LSBU, and um, to our global life. Um, it's also World Menopause Day. So today, the 18th is World menopause day so this has been fantastically planned and we have the most appropriate speaker so Karen Arthur has joined us and Karen has um, is a fashion creative a stylist a model a content creator a private sewing tutor <laughs> a menopause advocate and activist and an inspirational public speaker I would call her a force for menopause advocacy, a force for change and a force for happiness. A force for menopause advocacy because of her, um, her work around menopause awareness, a force for change because she has called out the different experiences of black women experiencing menopause 
and a force for happiness because her where you're happy is an inspirational approach to um, empowering us, to embolden us, to use our clothing and our accessories to, to be ourselves, to radically be ourselves. So on that note, I'm delighted to welcome Karen Arthur. Karen. Hello, hello. Happy World Menopause Day, everyone. Thank you for inviting me. Goodness me. Right, so my disclaimer is this is um, honey and lemon and ginger. Um, I have developed a streaming cold. I'm on, the, I'm on the day where you're sneezing constantly. So um, bear with me. At some point, I will blow my nose and at some point I will sneeze. But uh, someone said, um, that they love my backdrop. That backdrop, thank you, that backdrop is half of my headscarf collection. Um, when I'm doing styling sessions, I often have this up um, to demonstrate how to wrap your head and how to wear your scarf and that kind of thing. And I was putting it up and taking it down and putting it up and taking it down. And then I was like, you know what, I'm just gonna leave it up. And um, yeah, I love it. It comes in very handy. So thank you. So, who am I? Goodness me. I am, my name is Karen Arthur, as you know, and I am a fashion creative and all of the things that I was introduced as, thank you for that. Um, but it wasn't always this way. It wasn't always this way. So I was born in London. I was born uh, to Bayesian parents. Both my parents are from Barbados, Ivan and Joyce. And um, my father found it quite difficult in those days, in the early 60s, to get work. So there was a, um, a, like a scheme to move people out of London and into um, work in smaller towns. So we moved, my parents moved me and my little brother William to a small market town called Banbury in Oxfordshire. So I was brought up. Um, in Oxfordshire and I was a, what was I? I was an athletic child I was an optimist I had a lot of friends I liked to cartwheel down the road much to my mother's consternation I liked to climb trees and I loved to dance I loved all the creative things dance drama music um, my mother taught me, my sorry, my parents put me in piano lessons when I was very young because I had eczema and I would scratch. And so um, they wanted me to have something to do with my hands. And there happened to be a piano teacher who lived on the next road. So she offered to teach us how to play piano for a not like a tiny fee. I remember when my parents split up about 10 years later, she continued to teach me free. So when I found out that I could actually do dance as a degree, performing arts as a degree, uh, my art teacher dropped this particular piece of knowledge when I was coming up for 18. I was on that. I was on it. So I moved to Leicester Poly um, back in the day when they were polytechnics. It's now De Montfort University. And I had a ball. I, I have to say, I did think it was going to be like fame. I thought we'd be dancing on tables and, you know, disrupting traffic in the street, but it was nothing like that. But it was a lot of fun. And I did actually do um, some work, but I had a lot of fun um, learning performing arts and specialising in dance. I took my dance into teaching. Eventually I started teaching. I taught dance for... 17 years and it moved me back to London. I was determined to move to London. I was not going back to Banbury. For some reason, I thought the town was too small for me. Um, so I moved to London and I met my partner, uh, my ex-partner and um, had two wonderful children and I continued to teach. But all the time, I also sewed. My mother taught me to sew when I was 15 and I developed hay fever one summer and then the common wisdom was to stay indoors uh, away from the evil pollen and so I had six weeks in the summer when I was 15 when you know it was stretching out in front of me and I had nothing to do and so my mother taught me to sew I bought she bought me a simplicity pattern a pair of white wrap um wrap what's this word waistband trousers 
sailor's trousers with a wide hem um, and pockets, of course. And um, I loved sewing. So I continued to sew as I, as I grew older. And I, so I'm teaching, I'm sewing. Uh, at one point, my daughter's school, primary school, asked, sent a letter to parents asking if they wanted to take a stool up at their summer fair. And I thought to myself, you know what? That's something I could do. So I got six uh, different patterns of Ankara African print fabric from my, my mother-in-law, um, my partner's mother, and uh, I made six of the same design in different fabrics, uh, little bags. And I did a mailing list and we went along on this hot summer's day. My mother came down, she'd made some Bayesian coconut bread. Uh, my daughter did the backdrop for me. Uh, we had music and I sold out and I got lots of orders and I thought, oh, okay, all right, I can do this. So I started my, my little business excuse me, when I dab my nose, goodness me, I started my little business and I continued to do that on the side and actually sewing became the most cathartic thing. Something about designing and then designing something and then sitting down at the sewing machine after school, after a long stressful day, it almost like, it was almost like a therapy. I now realize that creativity is, it's almost like prayer. It's like, um, it brings me closer to me. That sounds a bit, I don't know. I want to swear, but I don't know whether I'm allowed to swear, so I'm not going to now. But anyway, it was the most um, freeing thing to do, especially working really hard at work, at school. Uh, I would do it mostly at the weekend. And then things started to take a turn. My relationship Excuse me while I blow my nose. One moment, I'm going to mute myself. If that's not a noise that you want to hear, thank you for your patience. Things started to take a turn. My relationship started to deteriorate. Um, my partner was having an affair. Um, I was trying very, very hard to hold on to our relationship. And it just wasn't working. And one day I decided enough is enough. With hindsight, I now realize that that was me entering perimenopause. For those who don't know, perimenopause, perimenopause is the, I don't know, the ball play of menopause, I suppose. It kind of like, it's the wake up call. And so eventually I ended that relationship but instead of putting myself into therapy and taking care of what I needed to do for myself, I threw myself into my job and I threw myself into making sure that my children were okay, my two daughters were okay, and that I would keep the house. So I kind of did that. I put the blinkers on and I, I threw myself into my work and I was very good at my job. I was head of house at school at the top of the road. I loved teaching. Kids are great. Um, but the system was changing. Um, emails came in, social media appeared, uh, testing became more rigorous. And I was often being asked to um, follow, toe the line and say things that I didn't necessarily, necessarily agree with. Things like, um, you know, if you get a certain amount of GCSEs, then you know that's better than not getting any GCSEs. And whilst exams are important, they're not the end of the world. You know um, that you had to go to university. University isn't for everybody. And so, I suppose because I was trying so hard to do as I was told, and because I also felt like I couldn't leave teaching, um, it kind of it worked against me. But I didn't realize that. I wasn't listening to the little voice in my head. We often don't. And I was trying to soldier on. I was trying to keep calm and carry on. I was being, you know, the strong black woman. I was doing what I'd seen my mother do. And I'd seen countless other women do, which is just when things fall apart, you, you know, you, you dry your eyes and you get up and you get on with it. But it didn't serve me. 2014. 
I hope you're still with me. It's really weird. It's like I'm talking to myself. I'm hoping um, we'll have much more of an interaction later on. Oh, yay, I've been waved at. So 2014 happened. And um, what happened? So both my girls went to university. And I thought I'd love it. I thought, oh, my God, I, my, I know where my clothes are and all the tops will be on my, you know, my creams and the house will stay tidy. And I liked it for about two days. And then I started to become, to become really lonely. I don't know whether you know that thing where, I don't know, suddenly when you have nothing else to focus on, you realise that, oh, my God, I need to focus on myself. And I started to realise that I wasn't really enjoying my life I often sat and thought is this it then I was 51 I was forgetting things I was forgetting meetings I had a lot of information in my head and a lot of experience but there are times when I honestly thought I, I didn't know what I was doing and I was scared to tell anyone because I thought I'd get the sack or I'd get demoted and I honestly thought I was going mad it was a very lonely time. And if you also add to the fact that I was having menopause symptoms like hot flushes and tingling legs, which at the time I didn't know were a menopause symptom, but I was more concerned about my mental state and I was in complete denial about my, the onset of menopause. I was signed off work. I, in all the time I was off work, I concentrated on trying to get better to go back to work, which is not the way forward, by the way, guys. And I did go back to teaching in January, but it just didn't work. And within three weeks, I was off again. I was uh, diagnosed with anxiety and depression. And I, I was trying to do different things. I went to the doctors. I had, uh, like many people, you go to the doctors, they haven't got much time. Their, their knowledge of menopause at the time, and still in some cases was very limited. So I remember mentioning anxiety and depression. I mentioned the fact that I'd fallen over and hurt myself and I mentioned menopause. And the doctor offered me antidepressants and did not make the link between poor mental well-being and menopause, which we now know, well, I hope you know, can be a symptom of menopause and certainly was for me. I declined antidepressants because I wanted to try something else. My mother is an incredibly holistic uh, human uh, lavender oil cures everything and so I wanted to see if there were other things I could do but still trying to get better to go back to work and eventually the penny dropped I just thought you know what I can't do this anymore I don't want to do this anymore it was like an epiphany and I left teaching now I'd been teaching for 28 years and I honestly thought oh well the job is the problem what actually happened is it just opened up a space for me to fall into. So what happened? I started therapy. I finally, finally took myself to therapy. I had been putting it off for years. I decided I couldn't afford it. I couldn't find a therapist. I looked half-heartedly. I thought everything will be fine. And it got to a point where I didn't have any choice. I took myself to therapy. I found a wonderful black woman who happened to live seven minutes away. And yes, I did count the minutes off. Um, and I chose this woman. I didn't realize at the time how important it would be for me to have a therapist who looked like me and understood me. We started on the same page. But I, so I started therapy. I started my brother is a Buddhist and he recommended a book by John Kabat-Zinn called, called Full Catastrophe Living. And it's about mindful meditation. He's the don of mindful meditation. And because I had an injury, it was also helping me to manage that pain as well. There was a lot going on, guys. Um, what else? Because I'd had dance practice, I'd always stretched. I'd always um, done some kind of stretch first thing in the morning. Not for long. But I deepened that practice because let's face it, I had nothing else to do. My day stretched ahead of me. I was incredibly lonely. I could hear the kids going up to school and that triggered me. I thought that they could see inside my house 
and wonder why I was off work and why I wasn't coming back. I miss my friends. A lot of my friends were teachers and obviously they were busy. But also I didn't want to see anybody. I was, a, I was not this person you see in front of me now. I'd always been loud. Uh, I'd always been almost berated for how loud my laugh was, funnily enough. And it, I was quite embarrassed about it. But I was also someone who hid behind my clothing. I loved fashion. I love fashion. And I, but I loved dressing up and I loved the validation from others. I loved the dustman telling me how great I looked. I loved people at work um, commenting about my head wraps and my earrings and my, you know, my, my clothes. I loved all that. Um, and so that was more important to me than wearing the things that I love, like I do now. I hadn't discovered where you're happy yet. And the way I discovered where you're happy is quite a sad story, but I wouldn't have it any other way. So I left work, I went into therapy, and at the same time, my Aunt Monica, who lived in Peckham, um, became ill, and she went into hospital. And I remember when she went into hospital, she had no children, and I'm the next of kin nearest to her in proximity. I remember when she went into hospital, imagining the niece I would be. I felt I was a bad niece because I didn't see her very often. So I remember um, when she went into hospital, let's have a quick dab here, excuse me. I'm going to blow my nose again. You're being so patient, I do appreciate it. She went into hospital and I had fantasies about what an amazing niece I was going to be when she came out. And she didn't come out. She she died, she passed in the hospital. And I took it much harder than I thought I was going to. I say that because my Aunt Monica and I were close in the sense that we were on the same page. We valued education. She would call me maybe three times a year and we would talk about all sorts. She was an eldest child. I am an eldest child. She would encourage me in everything I did. But I didn't see her. I didn't go and see her. I was busy. I, you know, I didn't really like her flat. It was pokey. I, you know, she was an older woman. I didn't really like hanging out with her. I was happy to have a conversation with her over the phone. But that was about it. And so I felt guilty. I felt I was grieving. And I felt guilty for grieving over someone I didn't know as much as I felt I should, if that makes sense. I was also the executor of her will. And I organised her funeral. And I threw myself into that, actually. And in the middle of that, I decided that I couldn't possibly be depressed because I was functioning and I laughed and I found things funny and all of that kind of stuff. And I didn't see pictures of, first of all, you don't see pictures of black folks depressed. I, I mean, I'm struggling now to think about it. But you also don't, when you, when you think of depression, you think of an image, you think of this kind of thing. It's very similar to menopause, actually, this whole kind of, Oh, oh my goodness, you know, life is awful. But depressed people have a myriad of emotions. And I wish that there were, there needs to be some campaign around this, you know. This is why people are always surprised when somebody takes their own life. Because often they'll say, well, I only saw them the other day. Or, but we were laughing at the pub, you know. And they, they take that on as feeling guilty because they feel they should have recognised it. No, it doesn't work that way. Depression doesn't work that way. So I convinced myself I wasn't depressed. And I really, really was. And I went deeper in depression. Once, once I didn't have anything to do, the, the funeral was over. The will had been executed. Her flat had been sold. And that silence rushed in. And I took to my bed, actually, I took to my bed. And when I did come out of my bed or when I did go out, I made sure it was in the middle of the day when nobody I knew would see me. I would wear my hair down. I have a, I have, I do have some dark clothes. I would put my hood up. 
hands in pockets, hugging the side of the road, the hedgerows and the walls, and praying, praying that no one saw me. And if someone did see me, I would pretend. I hid from people in Sainsbury's. I'm, I mean, I can laugh about it now, but I remember standing at the end of an aisle and seeing a parent at the other end and then rushing over to the other aisle so that she wouldn't see me, like playing dodge the, child, dodge the parent in Sainsbury's. Bonkers. But completely understandable. The way I came out of it, and I did come out of it, and I am through it, was through my aunt's clothing. I missed her terribly. And I had, when I cleared her house out, I kept three things. This bangle, this gold bangle, uh, West Indians will recognise these bangles. Some people have them all at their arms. I've never had them. Um, so I was given this by her sister at the funeral and I cherish it. And I play with it when I'm nervous and I think about her. And two skirts. Uh, one from Marks and Spencer's, St Michael, the old St Michael, and one from CNA, if anybody's old enough to remember the wonderful CNA. And I started to dress to lift my mood. Uh, I remember a memorable time I was going to a jazz festival. A good friends of mine run Jazz Refresh, and they used to do Jazz Refest, and it was at the South Bank, as it goes. And um, I had, it was a lovely hot day and I got out of the shower and I sat on the bed in my towel and I looked at my bed and all I wanted to do was get back into bed. I knew I'd arranged to meet a friend because I knew that if I arranged to meet someone, I was more likely to go. Um, and I knew that once I got there, I'd know everybody and I'd have a great time. But the from getting from my bed to the station seemed insurmountable. So I looked in my wardrobe and I made a conscious decision to choose clothing that I loved that would make me feel good. And I remember the, um, the outfit. So it was a bright kente cloth, heavy kente cloth, but meant that it was so tall I had to stand tall. A yellow wrap top that I'd made a pair of jeans that I happened to have made, some bright yellow uh, camper uh, bouncy sandals, and uh, I don't remember the earrings. Oh my God, I don't remember the earrings. Well, anyway. And I text my friend and I said, I'm going to be late. And she didn't answer. So that made me think, okay, so I definitely have to go now. And that got me out of the house. I knew that once I got to the station, I'd be fine. It was that bit. And after that, I started to do it all the time. I started to choose clothes that I love. Sometimes I look like an explosion in a paint factory, clearly. Sometimes it doesn't seem to, I wear things that don't match. My shoes are comfortable. I eBay all my heels. I just can't, I just can't do it anymore. Sorry guys. Um, I stopped dyeing my hair because I, I found myself shouting at the TV every time an advert for L'Oreal came on. And they were telling me to, what is it? Um, reveal the true me. And I'm going, this is the real me. I remember people telling me I was brave because I didn't dye my hide. I thought that was interesting. I'm not slaying dragons. I just can't be bothered to die. It's long. Uh, I wear my, aunt, uh, my aunt's um, skirts. I wear to places that I think she would enjoy. So where, when I need a little bit of courage, or when I, I'm going, she likes classical music. And so if I go to a classical music concert, because remember, I used to play the piano, so I'm very into, um, you know, piano concertos and things like that. And there's nothing like live classical music. Um, I would wear those and, and almost talk to her. And I know she's watching. I know she's um, seeing my journey. I know she's cheering me on. And she is someone, funnily enough, just before she passed, my mother told her I'd gone into therapy and my aunt called me to tell me off. She said, why are you paying a stranger to tell your business? You can talk to us. You can talk to your mother. That's very common in the black community. So I really was going against the grain, but I'm glad that I did. And now we're here. I 
talked, I used to talk about it on Twitter. Twitter was my weapon of choice in those days. And I coined the hashtag, where you're happy. I remember thinking I was talking to myself. I would talk to anybody who'd listen about um, wearing clothes to lift your mood. Because clothes do. Women are done a disservice by fashion. We are trounced and trussed up into clothing that, you know, um, might be too tight or doesn't suit us or doesn't fit us because we want validation from our girlfriends, from our boyfriends, from our partners, from strangers. Fashion used to be about, it, there used to be two seasons a year. Listen, every month I turn around and there's something new that I'm supposed to be wearing that's going to make me on trend. I honestly do not care anymore. And menopause, I will say, has gifted me that. That's the other thing. People talk about menopause. I'm going all over the place and I know that I'm going to overrun and I'm really sorry, but I'm not really because I feel like there's lots I want to get in. But I, I there's two things here. One, I think that women need to rebel. I think we need to say, I'm wearing this because I love it. I'm wearing this because somebody gave it to me and I happen to really like that person. I'm wearing this colour, this bright colour, because it makes it my pupils dilate. I love it. We get older, our bodies change, and fashion no longer seems to serve us. Back before COVID, you know, you learn, you start to wear a uniform. You know, you might have kids. You might be in a, you might be in a hurry. Often we are in a hurry. We've got lots to do. And fashion is the last thing on our mind. But we are sending a message with what we wear, whether we think we're not, you know. And so often you'll go into, I don't know, my epiphany was when I went to Wallace one year and I took 10 things into the changing rooms and not one thing fit me in the way that I wanted to, it to fit me because fashion doesn't cater for older women and our changing bodies and we feel lost we feel lost so my way of reclaiming myself and coming back to myself has been to reclaim my wardrobe I don't dress the way I used to dress when I used to teach first of all I don't wear heels I don't wear flesh colored tights my glasses are bonkers, my earrings are bigger, and the colours are a lot brighter. Um, but also, you know, we don't have to, we don't have to do as we're told. Sorry, I can feel my nose. I don't know whether you can see it. I hope you can't. I can feel my nose dripping. So pause on that. I can see the chat. I'm loving We can't see it, Karen, you're all good. <laughs> I can, I was imagining this like, you know, drip coming down from my nose. Um, yes, we, I think I want us to rebel. Oh my God, I've got so much to say. Basically, I feel like I love fashion. I fell out of love with it when I was depressed. I fell out of love with creativity when I, when I was depressed. I lost the will to do all the things that I've previously um, got such joy from. Now I'm not in that space anymore. I'm not gonna shut up about it. I'm not gonna shut up about how fashion has helped me to own being a fashion creative and a fashion designer. When people first started to say, they'd ask me what I did, and I said, I'm a bespoke clothing designer, and they'd make a face and look at me. And I didn't know what that meant either. But I couldn't own what I did because I thought fashion was fickle. And I thought fashion was for young people. And I thought fashion was fast fashion. I now realize that fashion is whatever you want it to be. We all have clothes in our wardrobe that we've stopped wearing for all sorts of reasons. We all have clothes in our wardrobe that we're saving for best. Best for what? Do you know we've been in COVID for almost two years and there are people who didn't make it this far? Surely your best is every day you draw breath, wear the clothes you love. Stop saving your clothing for best. We don't need an occasion. We really don't. 
but we've decided from you know the way that we were brought up and society wanting us to drop a load of money on on fashion that let's face it is going to end up in landfill after we get fed up with it um it means that we're not really using our wardrobes and there's a statistic around the fact that we wear some women wear something like 30 percent of our wardrobe homework you go to your wardrobe if you're right-handed you will find that most of the clothes you wear are right in front of you or slightly to your right and if you're left-handed the other way around because we just regurgitate the same stuff because it works or we wear a similar color or we we'll, we we'll wear black because someone told us that black makes us look slim it doesn't it just makes us look like somebody wearing black that's kind of it by the way sorry to um, you know break that to you so i am going to very fairly quickly go through i wrote an ebook called eight ways to wear you're happy and I realise there are so many more. Certainly I've come across more, but I just want to go through them with you so that we're all on the same page and so that you recognise that after this, you can go and look in your wardrobe and there will be something that you can find that you think, you know what, I'm going to wear that. I'm going to start with your knicker drawer. I'll tell you why. Often women say to me, and men actually, say to me, Oh, well, I'm, I, you know, they're timid or they're scared of what work will say or what their kids will say or that kind of thing. So I say start in your knicker drawer. First of all, you are worth wearing lingerie that you love. If your knicker drawer contains grey knickers, knickers with the elastic falling off, knickers that um, are, you know, falling apart, knickers that you don't like, chuck them out. Chuck them out. You need one to wear, one that's drying, and one just in case, and that's it. So actually, one of the things I did in the first lockdown, I must have, while everybody else was not, all the women were, you know, not wearing their bras, I was buying matching lingerie. I love matching lingerie. My matching lingerie is amazing, and I don't buy it for anybody but myself. I'm single, so no one else sees it but me, you know, in my mirror, and, you know, my grandson every now and then, you know. Um, so... Choose a uh, lingerie that you love. A friend of mine, a good friend of mine, Moira, I don't know whether she's on this call, but she <laughs> told me about how she used to work for a massive financial corporation and she was always delivering, you know, keynote speeches and, you know, talks to, you know, various grey suited people. And she would wear um, <laughs> red on lingerie and it gave her a kick. Because she said, basically, no one else was going to see it. And it gave her, it felt, it made her feel powerful, you know. Um, so I would urge you to start in your knicker drawer. Get rid of the stuff that you don't love or that doesn't fit or you've had for 10 years and really doesn't deserve to be there. And if you haven't got the money now, but you've got the money, you know, at some point, get your Marks and Spencers do great knickers. Or if you're like me and you love them, um, place that match in lingerie bravissimo or um when lockdown is not lockdown we're not in lockdown covid is well and truly over i urge you to go and get yourself measured um if you're a woman if you have breasts go and get yourself um measured at places like marks and spencer do it i was going to say debenhams but they've gone as well oh my god rigby and pella Rigby and Pella, you don't have to buy anything, you will, but you don't have to buy anything. They are the don of lingerie and, um, yeah, getting yourself measured. Anyway, let's move on from that because that's my favourite topic. What else? We'll go to colour. There are colours that um, you know make you feel good, but you don't wear because there's something about society that tells older women subliminally and you know, explicitly that we should be invisible. I'm here to say we're not doing that, guys. We're not doing that. As we get older, we have more experience, more knowledge on this planet, and therefore we need to be celebrated and we need to stand out. And this is our time. This is our time to stand out, not just by what we wear, but also what we say. So I would say, 
the colors that you love, that you used to love when you were younger, bring them back. You can start with, I don't know, bright earrings or accessories, and you can go, or you can go full on like me. This is a pajama suit that I actually wear out. I have a matching pair of trousers and I always get compliments when I wear it, but that's neither here nor there because I wear it because I absolutely love it. And the whole pink and red situation is, uh, is one to be celebrated. So color, find the colors that you like and go with them. Memory, I've mentioned before, my aunt, Monica, um, I have clothes from her that, only a couple of um, skirts from her that remind me of her. But also we, we may have jewelry that was given to us or passed down to us. I'm wearing this head wrap because I needed all the courage I could get considering I was expecting to be, you know, sneezing constantly. This head wrap I have had for 40, oh my God, 40 years. It's a piece of fabric that I bought in Banbury. Um, it's been patched to within an inch of its life and it's my favourite colour, orange. It's been on every single holiday I've ever been on and it has all the memories woven within its threads. Do you like that? So, um, yeah, memory. Textures. Um, soft clothes, silks, um, fleeces, um, cashmere if you, if you have that or if you're not, I'm, I'm allergic to cashmere, which is... Um, a complete bummer but whatever um clothes that feel soft um that's why we love worn jeans worn jeans are a wonderful thing um because they're soft on our skin so choosing clothes that are soft on our skin you can choose lingerie that is soft that you put on underneath your clothes in the winter so texture um clothes vintage clothing that has a history there's something about carrying somebody else's history into the future, you know, buying second hand. All of this fits, uh, uh, fits into the whole sustainable and wearing what you have and not buying so much fast fashion and, you know, that kind of thing. So shopping second hand or shopping for vintage clothing and carrying and wearing that history can also be something ca that can bring you joy. I've talked about my head wraps. I'm a big fan also of little, um, of hats. Um, I have a collection of little uh, pillbox hats and um, a couple of like fedora hats. And I love all of that. And people, some people say, oh, I can't wear hats. And I, I honestly don't understand that. Um, you just haven't found the hat that you love. But certainly headgear and um, pretty hats or you know the stylish hats are something that you can go for i've mentioned accessories you can start with accessories that have memories but you can also have mass you know big earrings or you know fun colored ties um ties with um different patterns on them that kind of thing these are i mean my glasses i had these made but you can get there are so many uh um glasses companies now cheaper glass like glasses direct and i think select specs where you can get really fun glasses that are reasonably priced so you can have a different pair of glasses every day if that's something that you wear or glasses without the with if you don't need to wear glasses glasses without the actual lens so have a play with that um fun shoes my fun shoes are my trainers i really like adidas um, I like shoes that trainers that come in different colours. I'm a big fan of a company called Uptown Yardie, who are a small independent company who make um, leather shoes, but also make these like fringed kilties, um, almost like golf shoes in different colours that are reversible that you can put on your um, on your shoes. If you're not sure about all these places, I think what I might do is give Neil all these links um, and Debbie all these links so that. Maybe you could have these after this uh, webinar. Um, that's it. Oh, and the last thing, which I didn't put in my ebook, but I think is important. I fell in love with perfume. Two things. Perfume. I'm a big fan of, um, there's a vegan perfume brand called Egan, Eden Perfumes. I used to love Chanel Number no. 5, but when I didn't have Chanel Number no. 5 money, 
um, I stopped uh, wearing, buying that, but I discovered Eden perfumes. They're a fraction of the price, they're vegan, and they basically replicate the smells that you like. Um, so I really, really like a smell that is for me, um, and that lifts my mood as well. Um, and finally, some people swear by makeup. My daughter's where you're happy, it's her makeup. There's something about the therapy of putting on makeup. I only started wearing lipstick in my mid 40s when I split with my partner and I went all in. I bought the lipstick, I bought the lip brush, I bought the lip coat, I did all the things. And then I stopped for a while and now I've started to wear bolder lipstick thanks to a, a matte lipstick because it doesn't come off in your mask. Um, and that's courtesy of a good friend of mine. Sharon Walters, who is a fantastic, amazing, talented artist, who um, lent me her purple lipstick a few years ago now. I think that's it. I think I want to say that, for me, menopause has been a gift. And growing older is not something to be scared of. I feel like menopause is something that when you're younger, you're scared of because the society has told us that it's the, the worst thing to happen to you and because we don't talk about it enough. When I was growing up, my mother didn't talk about menopause. She talked about, she might have said she was, it was hot in here and she'd whip her top off and sit there in her platex, cross your heart bra, and I'd just be embarrassed. But other than that, I don't know how she, all I know about her menopause is what we've spoken about recently, and she's 82 now, so she forgets a lot of stuff. I think it's important to recognise that I think that growing older is a privilege and I am so um, thrilled that not only that I can talk about my uh, menopause journey but also that I can share it with other people because I recognise that showing up as you know the silver haired uh, black woman who's 60 next year which I am so excited about um, and just being myself can be an inspiration to other people. And changing my life at what? At 50, at 52, literally flipping my life around. Yes, it wasn't great at the time. And yes, I had a pretty rough ride, but my goodness, I wouldn't have it anyway, any other way, because the voice that I have now, the voice that is speaking to you about menopause, about fashion, about, you know, about, doing different things about choosing things you love you love about curating your life you know the next 50 years or so if i'm lucky of my life in the way that i really want to and choosing the things that i love i think that that will show i hope it shows you and other people that you can do the same thing when i was growing up there was no one who looked like me doing what i do just because you know, people aren't doing what you want to do that look like you doesn't mean you can't do it. You just start it. This is how I started the podcast. No one sent for me. I just thought, you know what? No one else is going to do this. I'm going to do it myself. So I think I'm going to stop talking now. Yeah, I think I've rambled, you know, gone from different things. But I just want to say, if there's something you want to do, and if the only thing that's stopping you is because you think, oh, I'm, you know, I'm too old, it's too late, or no one does it, and they don't look like me, I'm here to tell you, get on with it anyway. You are needed and your voice is needed. I'm done. I'm shutting up. That's it. I'm going to blow my nose. <laughs> Perfect timing, Karen. Thank you so much. I'm just going to do a round of applause. And if you're out there, virtual round of applause. Oh my question. So I hope I mean, you know, I will probably think of other things I want you to say. I probably maybe I rambled a bit, but I, I am passionate and adamant that, you know, this is a time of life to celebrate. It really is. And I would want anybody younger who isn't menopausal at all listening to this to um recognize that, you know. 
This is nothing to be feared. If you're prepared and you do your research and you, you know, there's lots of people talking about menopause now, you will absolutely um, breeze through it because you'll work out what works for you and then you'll carry on and do amazing things. So um, I encourage the intergenerational chat. So Karen, you have given us, you've, you've given us a gift. You talked about menopause as a gift, but you've given us a gift because you've given us so many things to uh, talk about and think about. And actually, bef before we continue with the, with the conversation, I wanted just to stop for a minute because you have also, you've, you've shared with us some really difficult experiences. Um, and I want to give a space to recognise that, to honour that. You know, there were a few um, moments when you were talking, I held my breath. I held my breath because of the things you were saying, you know, the silence rushing in, you know, the guilt, the despair. I'm, I, so I don't know if there's a person on this call that won't recognise that and won't connect with that. And I just want to, so I want to thank you for talking about that and showing how powerful it was to have gone through that experience. Um, you know, we talk about real courage being, uh, it's about being afraid and doing it anyway. Uh, real success, I'm going to use the word success in the form of being happy it's about going through those moments and coming out the other side so I really want to thank you for sharing all those really difficult challenges those difficult moments with us so thank you thank you I appreciate you saying I, I think that um, I was on a call earlier this morning listening to some women talking about their menopause experiences and what they've been through and you know, we all have a different story, but we all have a story. And I, I, I suppose I want to acknowledge that World Menopause Day can be, it will be triggering for some women mm -hmm. because they're hearing stories that are similar to them. In some cases, they may feel it's too late for them because they wish they had this information. There's, you know, there's information I wish I had years ago um, that I didn't have. And it, and, also, going over your story again and again, you know, and if we couple that with the fact that it is Black History Month, and I know for a fact that, you know, people ask me about how I started my Menopause Whilst Black podcast, well, that involves me reliving trauma, and that involves me, people talking about what happened last year, which was, mm. you know, tragic and horrendous. So I, I want particularly to acknowledge you know, menopausal women who are going through it right now, somebody said she's having a hot flush right now and she just wants to strip off, I hear you girl, um, that listening to somebody, I don't want to be flippant about my experience because I couldn't predict how, where it would take me, but at the same time I also recognise there will be women who who feel quite sad, particularly today, because you can't get away from it today, so I want to acknowledge that as well, so thank you. And actually, to start off with, to kick off with my first question, I want to come back to something that, you know, you've just said, which is, um, what are the things that, you know, you know now that you wish that you'd known at the start of your menopause journey? What, what are those things? Oh, well, the first thing is that anxiety and depression can be, uh, is often a menopause symptom. I mean, that, for me, that's the no-brainer, like... Um, I wish I knew the word perimenopause. I wish I knew that black women went through menopause. I, there's so much. I wish I knew that there was a direct link between our mother's experience and ours if they haven't had surgically induced menopause. Um, yeah, so much. I wish I knew that when I try something, usually I do it really well. I wish I knew the power of my voice. I think that's the biggest thing, actually. I wish I knew that being honest with myself and therefore honest with other people would mean that I would find my voice and it would encourage and empower and cheer on other women. I didn't know that I needed to speak up. I had no idea. I thought I had to fit in you know, and I think this is common. We all have a voice, so there's no getting around that. 
it's just that um, I didn't understand my power. And I know Rebecca is on this call and she will know exactly what I'm talking about. You know, uh, that you don't realise how important it is for you to speak up until you do. And then it's like, it's a me too moment. It really is. So there, so there, there shouldn't be a taboo in terms of speaking about the menopause. And we've got World Menopause Awareness Day. Um, there are conversations, but there is, you know, are, are we breaking the taboo fast enough? No, of course we're not. Of course we're not. It's easy. It's like I said to somebody earlier, it's like learning a new word. You see it everywhere. But the other side to that is, I know what it's like. It's like the Brexit effect. So Londoners thought when, you know, that when the whole, whatever it was that we did, the referendum came, we were all lulled into a false sense of security because we thought most people in, many people in London were not voting for Brexit. And so we thought, yeah, everybody's like us, you know, and obviously that's not the case. And I think the same is for menopause is that lots of people are talking about it, but that's because everybody I follow talks about menopause. I talk about menopause. I am drawn to people who talk about menopause. Do you see what I mean? And and so it's easy to think it's everywhere. But I, w I do want to say this. The voice is getting louder. The voice is very white and middle class. I, 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 I do need and I know we know this. And I, I am very aware of and want to, you know, acknowledge and shout out for women who can't take time off to go to the doctors, aren't being listened to, mm. don't realise that they don't have a choice, work in workplaces where a menopause policy is just wouldn't, would never, it would never occur to people, work shifts don't have the money for HRT, don't have the money to go private, don't, can't afford, you know, your yoga menopause or your, do you see what I mean? You know? Oh, yeah. I, 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 I the reason we have, the reason we need to keep speaking is because we need to hear as many voices as possible within certain cultures, within different communities. Um, menopause is not something that's talked about. Um, and so, you know that that's why we we need to keep talking and we need to include everybody and remember that you know it, this is a conversation not for older women it's for men women um everybody you know everybody needs to be getting involved non-binary non lgbt everybody needs to be having this conversation because everybody wins and you know i'm thinking of that image you've used you kind of um, referred to when you talked about, you know, the woman with the head in her hands. And frankly, you know, that picture, and it's going to be a woman who looks a bit like me. She's going to be white, middle-aged, middle-class, head in her hands. And, um, and that image is problematic for all kinds of reasons, isn't it? It's problematic for all kinds of reasons, because, you know, as, as you say, um, there's such an inequality in the way that that image works and it doesn't tell the full story. It so doesn't. it doesn't tell the, 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 the full story. There's a really strong, oh, a really important issue about allyship and um, at Dallas BU, one of our previous events has been on male allyship for those experiencing the menopause as well as younger female managers being more aware. So how can we engage that wider group? How can yeah. we engage more people talking about the menopause? Oh God, uh, we st it's, well, it has to start at the top. Let's face it, we live in a white male supremacy society. Let's be very clear here. So a lot of the big, big companies, they have the, them at the top. And so that conversation needs to start there. But we have to find some courage. And we also have to speak up for those who don't have any courage. So, you know the thing where, where, well, I don't know whether you ever did this, but, you know, walking across the office with your tampon up your sleeve, you know, because you don't want anybody to know that you're going through a perfectly natural uh, cycle. I think it's something like that. I think that if we're in a situation where menopause is a normal conversation, you know, um, amongst mixed people, then it will be much easier to... Um, 
to advocate for people who need help. Menopause used to be a joke. You reach a certain age. There's another thing that's going on here is that we are, uh, women are celebrated for looking a certain way and that certain way is young. And so you, the correlation between getting older and menopause, you don't want to admit that you're that age. And there's also discrimination within the workplace for uh, black women, for older women, for menopause. So it's a perfect storm. Do you see what I mean? So I feel like if we have the courage to say, this is what I'm going through, um, and that it is that is easier when you're in a workplace or in a situation where the culture is to um, to talk about it. So this week we've had lots of announcements, and last week we've had announcements from ASOS. We've had we're going to have announcements from other brands as well, talking about their menopause policies and talking about giving women time off and stuff like that. And that's all great as long as it's not used as another rod to beat us with. You know, mm. as long as it's not used as another reason to not employ women over fifty. But we, you know, I, I feel like men um, and people who are supporting menopausal women, you know, it starts younger. It's, it's playing that podcast instead of putting your headphones on, playing it loud in the house. It's schools. It, we have uh, menopause is taught in schools. Apparently it came in in, I think, 2020 or this year anyway. And, um, Whilst that's great, it's, you know, I've worked in schools and so I know that the delivery is only as good as the person and the resources that you are, you know, the back, the backing that you're given. But certainly we're starting the conversation. It just needs to keep going. Listen, I am often having conversations with complete strangers about menopause on the back of sex myths and the menopause. People pointing at me going, you're, you're that woman, you're that woman who was, and I showed that to my husband and I, you know, and then we have, next thing you know, we're having this full on conversation about HRT or not HRT and all that kind of stuff. So just keep talking. And if you are someone who doesn't feel encouraged to, then finding podcasts and finding somebody online. Sometimes you just need one person who gets you. And that could be a chance for you to maybe start something at work. We have to find some courage, but we can only find courage if we are also in a culture that encourages that. Well, that was a bit of a sentence, wasn't it? <laughs> but, um, and and um, today we um, launched in, in LSBU, we launched our menopause policy um, and we've teamed up with Hempix um, to um, to become a menopause friendly workplace. But 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 the proof of the pudding is in the eating, isn't it? The proof of the pudding is in the eating. It's like actually, what's the you know what impact does it have? So how do you think um, you could have been better supported whilst going through the menopause? What can we do better in terms of the workplace? Mate, it wasn't mentioned once. I never heard menopause mentioned once. I'm, I'm honestly, um, had I known, well, first of all, if I'd known what I know now, I'd probably still be teaching. But also, had I felt that I could say, I thought it was me. Women need to not feel like they're on their own. I was so scared of being pushed out I was really good at my job, really good at my job. And I loved, you know, most aspects of my job, you know. Um, so how can it be best? How can you support support by talking about it, by having, I don't know, menopause cafes or, you know, or uh, menopause training or and, in, and not just targeting the women who were 50 plus because also women and younger than, and also you know we're living in a, a society that has the spectrum and so therefore if it's talked about then you're more likely to say actually you know um but we also need to fight against society saying that being young is better you know and looking young is better how many times you know do you get when somebody complimenting a woman on the fact that she looks young and not necessarily on you know what you or 
women who don't, there are women who don't want to talk about menopause. And the reason they don't want to is because they don't want to admit their age. And a lot of black women, we don't look our, you know, the age that people have decided we should look. So I've been shouting my age out for as long as I can remember. And I will, I sometimes pull people up when they go into the, oh, but you look so much younger. Well, I, I, don't, I mean, thanks. I, I recognise that to you, that's a compliment, but I look 59 because I am 59. That That's the way, do you see what I mean? Mm -hmm. So it's an open, honest dialogue, but it's also not making, helping women not to feel that they'll be pushed and sidelined, but actually they'll be celebrated for our knowledge. We have so much experience, the breadth of experience we have, and what a tragedy, it's immoral that so many women are leaving the workplace because, or going part time. Mm -hmm. And we're losing that expertise in the workplace. It's 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 criminal. It's criminal. And I'm glad it's changing. But my God, it's it's going to be slow. I hope that you know, ten years time, twenty years time, you know, young people are saying, "What you had are treating this like?" When they say women couldn't vote, you know, oh my God, you had to fight to get a menopause policy. This, you know, this was a thing. You didn't talk about it. I want people to be incredulous. This is what we're having to go through. But in order for us, for it to serve everybody, then we all need to be speaking. And actually, that's a beautiful segue because this is the moment to get those audience questions. So actually, it'd be great to hear what other people think. I've had the honour of having some time. So let's open the floor up now. I'm going to hand back to Neil. Neil. Thank you. Please stick around, Deborah. Um, so um, if anyone does have a question, we'd like to encourage you to turn your camera on and ask it. And we're going to get through as many as possible. We're still very keen to have our where you're happy um, moments um, and share those. So if you do have a question, please do pop your camera on um, and ask it. While I wait for you, I'm just going to go through. There's some lots of comments in the chat box. Um, there's um, Isa says women are not able to talk about their menopause symptoms with managers. We go quietly off um, sick. Um, we are hoping at LSBU to have um, menopause recorded absence added to our iTrend system. Um, and that's something that's being worked on. Um, we've got some comments from Leslie, um, middle age, mid, uh, middle age, middle class, mixed race, non-binary lesbian here, yelling about my perimenopause to my colleagues as often as I can. So we've got lots of comments in there, people sharing their experiences. So I'm going to come to the first question, which is Car Carly. Um, Carly, we'll come over to you first. Hi. I just really will. I actually have met Karen before and she's amazing. Um, Hi, I just, hello, darling. <laughs> I just really wanted to know because you know how much shit we always get when you get to a certain age. I'm 55. I've just started an MA, which I'm still freaking out about. But you know, it's like if you don't fit into those perceptions, there's a great danger that people will not take you seriously and it really pisses me off. And I just really want to know how you've coped with it. And do you think it will change because the colour of our hair or the colour of our clothes does not denote our intelligence? And it really, really winds me up chronically. They think you're some mad old bat. Yeah. First of all, nothing wrong with being a mad old bat. I, you know, I, I think so exactly too, but... <laughs> Um, uh, you get to the point where you don't care anymore. I mean, I used to care about what, I used to care when I first started to dress much more like me, I would walk down, walk up the road and I'd think, oh God, they're gonna think I'm a bit bonkers. Like, why am I dressed like this? But it, is very, it got to the point where I actually, it, I didn't care. And I think that it, when you get to the point where you don't care that they don't take you seriously and that you just speak anyway, it doesn't yeah. stop, as long as it doesn't stop you from saying your piece and speaking your truth, you'll be absolutely fine. It's fine that they think that you're... you're okay. It just makes me angry because I've always dressed like this and I, well, you know, I've always looked like this. And so, yeah. Yeah. you know, the older I get, the less seriously I seem to be taken. It's almost as if, oh, well, you can dye your hair and dress a certain way if you're younger, but the older you get, the more you're expected to conform. And that is really getting me really angry. And even from people my own age, that's where I'm finding the worst feedback. But Karen, so, 
you also have to recognize that for all the people who are not taking you seriously and thinking you're you know slightly bonkers there are also women and there are also younger people who are inspired by you who are inspired by the fact that you dye your hair and that you wear bright lipstick and that you wear what you want and you have to hold on to that as well mm. i didn't know that i was inspiring people i had no idea and then the you know as my profile uh, what's the word went up well up yeah, yeah that uh and and um you i'm getting dms and i'm you know and i started the podcast and that kind of thing you have to kind of drown out that noise and just mm. keep going and keep doing you because you are an inspiration all by yourself you know you, don't try not to I understand your anger and I understand that, but you will channel that into your MA and you will channel yeah. that into more positive things like your creativity and do amazing things. But yeah, bugger them. Yeah, fuck them all. Thank you. Thank you, um, darling. <laughs> um, Cleo, we'll come over to you. Hi, yeah, uh, I've struggled to not call you Miss Arthur. Um, <laughs> It's been a while. It's really good to see you. I can't bring myself to call you Karen. Um, but um, yeah, I, I actually put my question in the chat, but I also thought I'd turn my video on. So um, it's really good to listen to you. It's really good. And uh, just a quick comment on what was last sort of shared was that, um, yeah, people making comments. I've, I've always dressed the way that I've dressed and people suddenly stop saying, oh, are you going through a midlife crisis? because you know because of my age coupled with what I'm wearing and the thing I, th I think that the what I need to remember is that it's often people who have something no negative to say that will pipe up you know and you're absolutely right in what you say is there are people watching and taking note and appreciating but they just don't always say it and that's you know I have to try and remember that but um what I wanted to say was that I'm sort of starting a perimenopause journey now, probably last couple of years, but it's all kind of the pieces falling into place now, um, which is really kicking off a kind of drop in confidence, brain fog, you know, just inability to think with an unfortunate time where I, I think I'm ready to change a career. I'm, I'm, I need to make, I will need to make a change in the next couple of years, but the confidence that I will have the ability, you know, I always thought I would soar. I always thought I would do something brilliant and fantastic. And my kids have got to an age where I'm, you know, I'm the age I thought I would be able to take the next step. And I, I just don't have it in the bank a lot of the time. And I just wa wanted to know how you coped with that, how you, you were going to make this big change and you made it. And I'm, I'm going to assume that you had those kind of doubts as well. So yeah, some, some advice would be awesome. Gosh. Well, first of all, hi. Hi. <laughs> um, Cleo, I used to teach Cleo at my first, second school, I think. That was a very, very long time ago. So I still long. do the stretches. I still do your stretches. Oh, my God. Guys, and that was my piece of advice, by the way, anybody listening, is that um, stretching, if you don't move it, you will lose it. So um, stretch every day. Anyway, um, confidence. Well, I'll tell you what I did because I didn't know I was making a life change, remember? It kind of, I didn't have any choice really. Mm. Um, but one of the things that worked for me was um, affirmations. Now, this is gonna sound, you know, bonkers mad lady. Um, I would, th there's something about I am affirmations that is very powerful. And so when I learned to meditate and I started to do mindful meditation, I also did this thing where I would say out loud, I am powerful, I am vibrant, and say things that I didn't believe. Mm -hmm. People swear by either writing them down, journaling them, or writing them and putting them on your mirror and speaking them out loud. And I remember, um, I wasn't leaving my house, but I'd go out in the back garden, I'm lucky enough to have a garden, and we've got a tree there. And I would say them out loud to the tree. And I remember laughing at myself, going, Karen, what are you doing? This is bonkers, what are you doing? A year later, I was doing, I was saying them and then realized that I was believing them. And I hadn't noticed the transition. So there's something about saying I am and then adding that, whether it's powerful, uh, confident, all the things that you don't feel at the moment and you grow into them. I will also say that 
you know, perimenopause is a time that is a time where for us to look at the things in our life that are no, no longer serving us. And often that can be our diet. It can be um, what we're consuming, whether it's what it might be TV or whatever, but also what we're eating. Um, so it might be also worth looking at things that can help you, whether it's going the holistic route or going to the doctors, going the HRT route. Either way, it's not something to, perimenopause is not something to put your, stick your fingers in your ears and hope it will all go away. Surround yourself with people, friendship groups, I just want to say, make sure that your friends are the people who pick you up and they're the, they're the friends that are encouraging you and not the friends that drain you. My friendship circle has done that. It, it shrunk because I realised that some people just take a lot out of you and some people when you change and when you do things that step outside of your comfort zone it reflects what they're not doing and so they're more likely to be negative than positive so do make sure that you spend less time with people who make you feel like shit and more time with people who are absolutely championing what you're doing um i hope that's helpful uh, certainly the affirmation thing was something I didn't think was, um, I didn't, I thought it was a bit weird, but it's the one thing I've, I've, I did, a, um, I have these conversations with my daughters and we talk about affirmations and I've written some affirmations for them and given them to them for their, you know, for Christmas as gifts and things like that and affirmation cards. I mean, I have lots of links if you're interested afterwards, but certainly that the power of, what's in here this is so powerful and beats it what did, what did they say you are the sum of the five or seven people you're with something like that your friendship groups looking at who is who really makes you feel good and maybe sliding away from those who are reflecting you know and projecting on you um and you'll be fine it's a transition um yeah, you'll be you'll be great. You'll be great. I'm rooting for you, Cleo. Um, Thank you. <laughs> Husband walking past. I know you're actually right. It's just a very specific. Like I had no idea that um, that self esteem, like that very thing, could be quite targeted by a drop in hormones. And it's actually, you know, it's it, it's it's not just depression, anxiety. Like self esteem, you think, wow, how can it get to that? But it and it really does. But and I believe in the power of words. So that's a great suggestion. Thank you. Yeah. We stand in our own way. This confident Karen is not the co the person that people would have said was confident ten years ago. You see, I was standing in my own way, and these people show that they're absolutely true. You have to have to have to believe in yourself. And you can do absolutely anything. It sounds weird, but it's absolutely true. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks, Miss. That's all right. <laughs> um, <laughs> Karen, you touched you touched on kind of like the routes that people go down. So Maureen has a question in the in the chat box. How did you cope with the symptoms? Did slash are you on HRT or did you get go down the homeopathy route? If you're happy to answer that. Well, hear the joke. So when I started doing my podcast, I was firmly holistic, team holistic, because my mother is someone who would barely take a painkiller I mean you, I told you I took painkillers just before I came on here um paracetamol just before I came on here but I also thought that because my mum had soldiered on I needed to soldier on as well and I didn't know anybody any black folks who were taking HRT the other side to that is the 2002 um report around HRT was telling everybody that it would give you breast cancer. And my mother, when I mentioned HRT to her, she would go, oh, I'm not taking that. That will make me ill. You know, that kind of thing. So all of those were reasons why uh, I decided to go the holistic route, route. The other reason is because I didn't think my symptoms were that bad. I was having hot flushes, but I could cope with them. I was having tingly legs. I could cope with them. I conveniently decided that anxiety, depression was just a blip, you know. Um, but since then, I did the programme with 
uh, Davina McCall, Sex Person in the Menopause. I've done lots more research. I've spoken to lots more people. And I'm very aware that HRT has come a long way. So I did actually start hormone replacement therapy two months ago. Um, hormone replacement therapy is also around... Um, for me, it's an investment in my future. I have things to do. And I need to be on my A game. And so... HRT is uh, replacing the hormones that have disappeared out of my body. It's going to take a while because it's been a long time since I had my last period. But certainly it's supposed to um, help me uh, prevent heart disease, help os against osteoporosis, help against um, developing Alzheimer's. There's a lot of pluses for it. So I decided to try it. I thought to myself, you know what, if I don't get on with it, then I'll just stop. But um, yeah, so I'm two months in, guys. There's a little confession for you. <laughs> I was on, a, I was on a, um, I was actually on one of Henpick's um, webinars the other day, and um, Dr. Shadat Shazadi Harper was yeah. saying about how the, how the benefits far out, outweigh the risks, and people need to start do. talking about the benefits more. And Rebecca, we'll come to you for a quick question if that's okay, and then I'm really keen to get some where you're happy on the screen. <laughs> so, Rebecca, <laughs> over to you. Um, Hi, Karen. I had more of um, wanted to share more gratitude with Karen for talking up and sharing what she knows and having somebody that looks like me. Um, what are they trying to finish? So, as I was listening to Karen, I am um, somebody else's. Somebody else's. Okay. Um, so, whilst you were talking, I actually pulled an affirmation card which actually says i am enough oh you see you see and so many things will fall into place once you have some more knowledge about what's available what can happen and you're part of my journey so yeah. thank you very much rebecca first of all thank you for speaking secondly did you make that top that's wicked yes ah come on um wearing my happy Yes, Rebecca is a fellow soist. Um, but also I didn't say, and I'm glad you brought it up, that gratitude was a game changer for me. I would uh, write down three things that I was grateful for. And then I would send three, um, I would send love out into the world. I sound bonkers, but honestly. So three things I'm grateful for. And three, I would say things like, um, I would send love out to my brother who's going through a difficult time, or I would send out, you know, love to people who have lost somebody, that kind of thing. And gratitude really is a game changer. Explicitly thanking whoever you believe in for three things on that day. Honestly, um, it just makes everything else pale into significance. And when I'm feeling at my lowest, and I'm having a pretty tough time at the moment, I've got a bad back and a cold. When I'm feeling at my lowest, if I sit down and start to write down all the things I'm grateful for, you can just keep going. You can, we've all got something to be grateful for. So thank you, Rebecca, for, um, for raising that. And thank you for being there. I'm part of my journey, isn't it? <laughs> thank you. <laughs> thanks Rebecca um we would now like to invite everyone who wants to share your where your happy moment onto the camera I don't think we'll have time to go through them all um but if you are where if you are if you are wearing something that makes you happy please pop your camera on because we'd love to see it um and we'll go we'll do a quick round robin um of, of your where you're happy so um I, it'd be great to see lots of faces on screen and I think we'll try and get a photo of it as well um so we can pop it on social media with the hashtag where you're happy deborah um deborah as a as a as a as a guest i would like to invite you to share your where you're happy first trying to unmute it's my little b pin that was bought by my son for me it was stupidly expensive and i saw one in a shop and i loved it and i didn't think i could that i could have could justify spending it and he bought it for me for Christmas oh I love it thank you that also means that every time you wear it you'll think of him that's I will say that for me my favorite way you're happy is the memories because um it brings us closer together so thank you for sharing that 
Thank you. Um, Callie. Oh, you're, you're on, on mute, mute, my darling. <laughs> there we go. I pressed the wrong button. I'm wearing... I actually bought this dress in two colours because it's jersey and it's soft. And it's one of the first dresses I made, I bought that I hadn't made myself for a long time. I inherited an overlocker from my aunt and I went through a stage of just buying fantastic fabric down um, Kingsland Road <laughs> from the little African man and uh, just making loads and loads and loads of dresses. And these, I bought this one and I got it in pink and blue. And it's the first dresses I bought that I hadn't made, but I just love it, even though I haven't made it. Brilliant. Just makes me feel lovely. Lovely. Thank you. Um, Chris, are you are you sharing away your happy moment? Hello. No, no. Okay, we'll come to uh, we'll come to Cleo. I have a bit of an accidental where you're happy. I, I'm a big fan of a grey sweatshirt, which doesn't seem particularly imaginative, but it is in, um, emblazoned with my, uh, it's a design that I did myself. I uh, did have a children's brand. So it's a lightning bolt in a leopard print, which, uh, uh, which I also designed myself. So yeah. Love it, love it. Love Very it. cool. I love a bit of leopard print. Who doesn't? Um, <laughs> Rebecca, over to you. I'm wearing the top that I've made myself. Um, I actually met Karen through sewing and crafting many, many years ago online. And I actually came and supported at a, at a sewing event through the snow at Olympia. <laughs> I remember. And, <laughs> the stitching show. Yeah. And... I just feel warm inside when I put on something that I've made that someone's going to say, oh, that looks really nice. Yeah. And I can say either, yes, I've made it, or then follow it up with, it's also got pockets. <laughs> <laughs> pockets are a feminist issue. Don't get me started <laughs> on that. <laughs> um, and Chris, are you, are, you, are you here to share your happy? Just come to you one more time. Uh, oh yep, yeah. Chris, yep. Yeah. yeah, I'm coming away from USA. I'm happy about I'm feeling the freshness of going to the almost pre-pandemic levels in my lifestyle. I'm back, I'm back to going for a walk outdoors, watching a spring fan outdoors, and much more I can do out, outdoors. I'm proud of it. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. And um, Leslie? There we go. <laughs> so I'm wearing a brand new shirt that I bought last week um, because a friend of mine is getting married uh, and I needed a shirt to go with the kilt that I've hired um, to go to the wedding. And um, uh, I also am wearing a bow tie because this is one of my favourite bow ties that I've owned since I was 16-ish. Um, and I'm 45 now, so uh, definitely not fast fashion. <laughs> uh, and is it, can I ask a question? Is it a bow tie that you had to do up yourself? Oh, yes. Oh, I am. Oh, my God. Listen, I used to make those. And, I, and, and as a result, I had to teach myself how to do a bow tie. It's not super easy. It's not, no. Um, it's a skill that my dad yeah, taught yeah. me. Um, so every time I wear a bow tie, it's uh, a thing that reminds me of him as well. So. Oh, that oh that has brought me joy. That's wonderful. There's so much going on there. Thank you so much for sharing. No problem. <laughs> Thank you so much, everyone. So we are unfortunately at the end of the oh. evening. I feel like we could have carried on um, for a lot longer. Um, Deborah, I'm going to hand over to you for closing. But before I do, um, we still have some more events coming up for Black History Month um, 2021 at LSBU. And I'm going to share those um, just in the chat box now. Do check them out. Um, I will also send round 
um, a link with the recording to the events we've had so far. We had a fabulous event with Brixton based charity Poetic Unity, as well as the amazing poet uh, Nairobi Thompson. Um, so do check out some of our events. We have the amazing Dr. Ronks joining us um, next week um, as part of our LGBTQ Thought Leaders series. And they're going to be talking about um, challenging public perception. Um, so I've just popped the link in there. Karen, thank you so much. Deborah, I'll hand over to you for closing. Thank you, Neil. So, Karen, thank you. Despite a streaming cold, <laughs> you have energised and inspired us. And um, you've demonstrated, actually, just in this talk, you've demonstrated every concept that um, that you've talked about. So you have you have shown us how you celebrate yourself. You have had that authentic voice, that authentic voice, you know, that um, you know, that 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 is you. Um, and you have shown us that self-care with your with your cup of ginger and lemon juice. So 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 thank you for coming to us um, and thank you for giving us so much to think about and so many things to do. So I know that I'm certainly going to be thinking about surrounding myself with people that buoy me up with my champions, stretching mm -hmm. and um, it, my knicker drawer is probably firmly in my sights now. So so thank you for those tips i want to thank neil for hosting this event neil had some amazing uh, corporate events manager and i want to thank everybody for this call everyone who shared their where my happy everyone for who's contributed to the chat everyone who's here and has listened thank you all and uh, i look forward to seeing many of you at our next events Thank you so much for having me. Thank you. I've really, really enjoyed it. We will see, we hope to see you in person soon. Yes, I hope so. <laughs> Bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.